Ben and Chris. Thank you, Kathleen, and good morning, everyone. You know, I, I think that uh, change, it's a change, isn't it? Another $1,000 giveaway for today? Have they done that before? They, they probably realized that you were leaving early, not enjoying all those wonderful exhibitors that are there, so they bribed you by keeping you here yet another day. Good. We like that. As exhibitors, we like that very much. <laughs> uh, Chris and I have been doing presentations together for a number of years, actually, all within the, uh, the back net arena, if you will. But we're not really here today, this morning anyway, to talk about back net in particular. What we are here to talk about is smart buildings or building intelligence. Uh, we have some learning objectives associated with today's presentation. I'd like you to keep these in mind. By the end of our discussion today, we want you to be able to render some sort of definition for what makes a building intelligent. Uh, there are contributing elements to that. Maybe you can identify a couple of them. That would be good. We will be citing at least one case study, and Chris will be talking about some real-world examples of some, thing, some things as well. So let's try to learn some lessons about what other, other facilities have done. And then always, and I suggest this for all the sessions you attend, of course, and that is keep in mind and try to consider what sort of things that you're hearing you might want to implement in your own building or portfolio of buildings. Okay, part number one. It's alive. <laughs> Science fiction books and films are replete with this theme. You know, when it becomes sentient and begins to take over the world. It, by the way, could be a computer system, a robot, or some other thing. And it's never a good thing. It's never a good thing. That is, until the humans finally wake up, fight back, and realize they put way too much faith in whatever that thing was. <laughs> So when the subject of building intelligence comes up, we might be tempted, as I have been, to recall Terminator-like scenes and head for the hills in fear. Well, maybe not. But this is a good time to consider what are you really trying to achieve? What are we trying to get to when we talk about building intelligence? What's the goal? I'll suggest to you that you probably have at least a couple of motivations in mind when you're thinking about building intelligence. One would be simply more efficient operation of a building. Efficiency lowers cost, of course, and the promise of building intelligence is, could be summed up in that one word, efficiency. Which means to you personally, of course, that you have much better things to do with your time than worry about the operation of your building. If it's attending to many of its own needs, you can attend to more important things. Uh, you know, like playing games on your smartphone or whatever. Smart buildings also tend to be more attractive buildings from a tenant to retention perspective, and it's a very competitive environment that we're in in the building space continuing today. We're not back in the mode yet of building lots and lots of new buildings, are we? We have a glut of buildings in virtually all vertical markets, with the possible exception of healthcare, and therefore it's a competitive environment that our facilities are in. Adding some intelligence to your buildings really makes it, uh, oh, I just discovered another clicker. Chris, there's another clicker here button on the bottom. Uh, okay. And finally, the sustainability is, is a, a natural result. Uh, when a building is more efficient, it is more sustainable. When it's more sustainable, it's more attractive and therefore tends to retain those tenants better. Uh, so any, you, you might be motivated by any number of, of those things there, but I'll suggest to you that efficiency is the top goal of intelligent buildings. Now, what is building intelligence? I'm going to offer you a limited definition of building intelligence, and Chris is going to amplify that definition slightly. I will share with you three dimensions of building intelligence, and Chris will share with you a fourth dimension. I like to think of building intelligence in terms of three axes in space. And I refer to the first axis as automation. The second axis I refer to as integration. And the third axis as data analytics and visualization. 
Now, let's see, you're imagining these three axes in space now. Now, let's imagine an infinite cube. And I realize that one's not infinite, but I tried. And as we have, uh, yeah, if we're very close to the center, or the fulcrum of, that, of those three axes there, building intelligence is relatively low. But if we make progress on any one of those three axes, our building intelligence improves. And if we have a high amount of all three of those, in my mind, we have a pretty darn smart building. The first axis I want to talk about just slightly for a couple of minutes, and then we'll get into, by the way, we have a case study associated with this section. I really want to devote more time to that than talking about these three things. I think you understand inherently what automation is, but basically we're talking about hardware and software that ties together various and controls various building systems. And I consider it the low-hanging fruit. It is relatively easy today to automate one or more systems within your building. And it's relatively low cost today. It's a competitive environment for contractors as well. Uh, and you can get these jobs done that will return investment relatively inexpensively today, at least compared to years past. And I realize controls projects can still be quite expensive, but the return on investment is, has been growing shorter and shorter and shorter. I've noticed the trend, and I've been in the controls world now for about 12 years, and payback, return on investment, has continually been pushed, mostly by you folks, been pushed to be shorter and shorter and shorter. And uh, we've, seen, we've seen controls uh, payback of projects under, well under a year, uh, where it was multiple years in, uh, in decades past. Why do we do automation? Well, the first thing is to enjoy those efficiencies. You know, you can operate your building in virtually every system of your building manually if you want, and if you have enough feet uh, to go cover those acres and acres of, of facility. But we, we can achieve a lot of efficiency in terms of automation, and typically we achieve these four goals. I don't want to talk about those in particular. I spoke about those more particularly yesterday and you can uh, download all the presentations from this conference afterwards and, and look at those points. But we do achieve through automation higher energy efficiency, lower operating and maintenance costs, better indoor air quality, and greater occupant comfort and productivity. And I'm a big believer in that. Let's talk about what systems can be automated. And this, by the way, is a relatively short list. There are other systems that can be operated, but certainly the mechanical systems, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, any kind of terminal units, lighting, uh, all, it definitely requires some kind of automation today. Access systems can be automated, security, uh, closed circuit television. Uh, fire and life safety systems are automated, typically uh, separately from other systems, but even those can, uh, can be brought in with others. Renewable energy sources are growing in popularity. We're seeing commercially viable buildings that are using photovoltaic, wind power, turbines, etc., and returning power to the grid and offsetting their energy spend. Uh, windows and louvers uh, for daylighting purposes are being automated. Irrigation systems, landscaping systems, uh, parking facilities. I talked to a very progressive own, uh, uh, director of facilities down in Texas not long ago, and he's enjoyed several efficiencies by automating his parking systems. Uh, smoke controlled doors and dampers uh, of necessity need to be automated. Mass notification systems. So when an event occurs in the mechanical systems that might require some response, it can automatically trigger something in the mass communication system to get the word out. Uh, elevators, emergency power, I've seen, uh, I've seen trash collection automated, I've seen mullion heaters around convenience store refrigerated doors automated. Uh, anything that can be controlled manually can probably be automated. And the more systems that you automate, the more efficient your building will be. What's next in terms of automation? Uh, I like to refer to what I call the, you've heard of the Internet of Things, oh, excuse me. 
I like to refer to the internet of building things. And I think it is what's next, by the way, in all three of these axes that I'll be discussing with you here. Uh, but what we're seeing in the controls related arena in terms of automation is that the intelligence is being pushed to the edge of the network. We used to have supervisory control devices, operator workstations with middleware software, and I suggest to you that all that is going to go away. The intelligence, IP connected devices at the edge of the ne network will talk directly to the enterprise and feed their data up to that enterprise accordingly through IP and wireless uh, technologies. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is a, a number of sensors. We're sensing everything today, and as a result, the cost of these devices have been, has been driven extremely low. Now, meters, on the other hand, are still relatively expensive. I'll suggest to you that as they become ubiquitous, as they become commodity devices and more and more demand, the, those costs will continue to be driven down as well. But we're going to see a lot more sensors. Or you may not see the sensors, but there will be a lot more sensing taking place within buildings. And of course, uh, today's users in the home and certainly in the commercial realm are requiring mobile access to their systems. So the notion of that dedicated operator workstation with a Windows-based software package there, I really suggest to you that that is going to go away. Uh, and controls manufacturers are very much aware of these trends and are heading in that direction. Uh, integration. Integration is a fairly uh, simple concept. It simply means you're bringing together one or more of those systems that you have automated. Uh, typically, that's done through some, com some common user interface, but there are also devices that can do that by themselves and operate autonomously to some extent. Uh, many, building of your, many of your building systems are often interrelated. When I swipe my card to enter my office, of course, it should know that the mechanical systems need to be activated, the lighting systems need to be activated, so we have access tied to lighting, tied to HVAC, et cetera. That's a fairly, fairly common thing that's done today. Uh, but those synergies also help you, and that is that you're not necessarily learning various systems in the building and working with the various interfaces of all those systems, you're learning one system. Uh, and it can also help you consolidate service providers. Now, I know you love your service providers, uh, but you can consolidate them. And today's, uh, today's uh, system integrators, if you will, are learning all of these systems. Uh, and you won't necessarily need to reply, uh, rely on rather a, a dedicated controls contractor or a dedicated lighting contractor, et cetera. Uh, the Internet of Building Things is next in terms of integration, and we're talking here about data, lots and lots of data. I've had a very progressive friend of mine for the last oh, do half a dozen years has been saying to me, Ben, it's all about data. Now, I'll suggest to you that it's all about what we do with the data, but it is all about data. And all those sensors that we talked about are relaying all of that data up to the enterprise. And so when a building system is integrated, we're feeding all of that consolidated data up to the enterprise. We're doing a lot more measurement and verification than we used to. I was hitting the laser button there. Uh, but there is one thing that will, and these changes are happening fairly rapidly. This cyber threats and cyber protection, by the way, is one thing that could really put the brakes on things. Uh, it is a big concern. Uh, you're, you're aware of all the security breaches that have happened in terms of credit card systems and other, other things, but we have seen in the world uh, penetration into facilities through control devices. And it's a scary thing, and controls manufacturers and others aligned with the industry are very concerned about it and are taking steps to ensure that even, you know, you, th you stop and think about it, you think, well, Ben, what are they going to do? They're going to go into a building and turn up the heat? Oh, boy, that's going to scare some people. Uh, but no, what they're actually doing is getting in through that system and then from that system getting into all the other integrated systems and can really cause some havoc uh, if they're sufficiently motivated. Now, there are easier targets uh, for, th uh, for those interested in terrorism out there. Um, nevertheless, we need to be cautious. 
We are also seeing here, uh, as I kind of hinted to a little earlier, uh, a new generation of, of service providers to your facilities. IT savvy people. Um, I've, I've worked with firms in the past, um, for example, who have, you know, who early on in the controls world anyway, you had to be fairly mechanically inclined uh, and have a great deal of mechanical knowledge and they really don't worry about that so much anymore. They're talking about the, the net, network and the connectivity of that network and their IT computer people versus mechanically inclined people. Uh, and those mechanically inclined people are, uh, are becoming uh, extinct, unfortunately, in many respects. Data analytics and visualization. What, what we're referring to here is just a means of, cre of creating information that we can understand. This data is everywhere. It's like, you know, I compare it to looking down the Las Vegas Boulevard here at night. And what do you see? Lights and lights and lots of lights and noise and people. It's, it's extreme amount of information there that your eyes and ears and nose perhaps are picking up. Uh, any smokers in the room should be aware that I'm very sensitive to all that smoking on the sidewalks and in the casinos. It really bothers me, but, <laughs> but it's your right. I understand. Um, anyway, all that data has to be presented in such a way that it can be understood, and that's what data analytics and visualization can do for us. Uh, here's a quote by Delo the, the consulting firm Deloitte. Um, the use of data analytics or predictive analytics allows organizations to efficiently extract clean, clean and standard, you don't want dirty data, by the way, you got to have clean data, and standardized data for multiple operation and legacy systems as well as data in the public domain to deliver real insights. What, that, what we're translating that rather officious statement, we're saying we're presenting information to help you make better decisions. It starts with a graphical representation of some sort. This has been happening for years. You see graphical representations of your mechanical systems in your buildings. You can see those today and you have for, for many years. But it moves on to dashboards. And when we use the term dashboard, we're really, again, talking about specific pieces of information that help you make decisions. And it culminates in systems that can actually offer you suggestions about what is happening. They don't necessarily rely on feeding you data so that you can make an intelligent decision. They are recommending options here. There is something out of tolerance here. Perhaps you should go address that, alert your maintenance staff, technician to go and check this out, etc. Uh, there's a couple of examples here on the bottom of real world examples, by the way, of current kind of dashboard trends. But they're becoming more and more visual and 3D and HTML5 based uh, packages that are very, very, very nice. What's next? Truly actionable analytics. We have fed in the past just a lot of data to people and expected them to, be, to know what to do with that data. And today, we're, we're really aiming for, and certainly tomorrow, we'll be aiming for analytics that really enable you to make a decision, an intelligent decision about your, your facility. We're seeing today customized views of this kind of, inf they can go to you, assess your needs, and create a, a service provider can create a view that is customized to you. Tomorrow, you will have even greater ability than you have today to customize those views as your dynamic needs change. Everything is moving to the cloud. Uh, I don't think I need to talk about that anymore. And final, one final note there is we're seeing some strange alliances taking place. You know, we've depended on companies like, you know, Siemens in the past to, to be leaders in every respect of the buildings. But there are these small upstart software-centric companies uh, that are highly focused, highly agile, and creating very dynamic analytics-based solutions uh, that they can put on top of a Siemens systems or a Delta or, or an Allerton system or a Johnson system. Uh, and they do, uh, and, the, and they're creating some, neat, uh, some kind of neat uh, alliances. I like to use cooper, uh, uh, let's see, we've got cooperation, co com competition, what if we could mix those two words together? What would we get? 
cooperation. <laughs> and I really like that word, and I, th I see it happening more and more and more as these firms are aligning with one another to create solutions. I'll fin finish my time with you with a little success story here. Uh, of the Bullet Center in Seattle, Washington. This is a commercial office building, new construction, completed uh, in May, uh, Earth Day of 2013. So it's been operating for about a year and a half, six stories, 50,000 square feet. You see a nice uh, architectural rendering of the facility there, and here you see a nice actual photograph of the building. Its claim to fame is it is the world's greenest and most energy efficient office building. It is, in fact, the first commercial building in the U.S. to uh, meet the requirements of the Living Building Challenge. Are you familiar with the Living Building Challenge? I'll give you a website to go to. I don't have it in the slides here, so if you want to write this down, please do. Living-future.org living living slash LBC, Living Building Challenge. You'll want to go there and you'll see, by fa in fact, a more in-depth case study of the Bullet Center uh, on that website. It, it by the way, won uh, Project of the Year last year from BACnet International. We do those awards every year that you saw yesterday, for example. What kind of characteristics uh, were employed in this? By the way, the Living Building Challenge, I, really, I, call it, I, I like to call it le lead on steroids. You know, LEED has, be, has had to water itself down to be politically correct and meet the needs of all the parties involved. Well, the Living Building Challenge says, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we we want to be green, and we're going to be totally green. And in fact, um, the, one of the requirements is what they're trying to do is replicate nature's architecture. So think of a giant tree. Do, how much does it demand in terms of the electrical grid or, or the sewer <laughs> systems? <laughs> So uh, the Living Building Challenge requires a building to be off the grid entirely, water, sewer, electricity. Uh, and this building is a commercially viable office building, six stories, 50,000 square feet. It has a low leakage shelf, smart windows, Forest Service certified wood products, recycled products used in the building. They made a lot of considerations in terms of volatile organic compounds and any kind of off-gassing of any kind of the materials that went in the building. Uh, They're doing rainwater collection for potable water usage. Uh, and in Seattle, of course, they can do that. Although I understand from a friend, it hasn't really rained there in like the last four months. <laughs> I'm hoping they saved up a fair amount of rainwater. Um, they're doing composting toilets on site. Now, I know that sounds just absolutely awful, <laughs> but, but they are composting human waste in, in, on the building, on site, and processing it. Uh, there is a, to the total top rooftop of the building is a, is a photovoltaic system. They then have other ledges, terraces that they use for green roofs with lots of vegetation, uh, et cetera. So it's a pretty cool building. Uh, the intelligence provisions. There are just uh, uh, the, the latest and greatest that you can do with mechanical systems, I guess, is the best way of summing up that. Lo of course, backnet control is there. Radiant heating and cooling, smart windows, backnet controlled. Lots and lots of sensors, d demand control ventilation taking place there so that you're just bringing the right amount of ventilation into the building, not paying for more than what you have to. And then finally, a, a dashboard that presents to building occupants and visitors the, the status of that building and what it, how it's performing. And so what you're seeing there on that one page there, you're seeing those three axes I talked about. You're seeing automation, you're seeing integration of systems, and you're seeing the data visualization tools all right there on that slide. So I will suggest to you, in closing, that we should push the limits on all three of these axes and, and go for the smartest building on the block. And should your facility ever become self-aware, well, you can always head for the hills. <laughs> Having said that, I'll turn the time over to Chris.
it's not there. Uh, go ahead. I'm listening. Well, like I said, there are unfortunate aspects of losing the, those skills. We are seeing today a trend toward uh, the, the IT folks. Essentially, having some redundancy or some fail-safe type of type of solution, absolutely, yeah. You can always have, of course, some fail-safe systems, and you, sh you should, frankly, have fail-safe systems. Yeah. Good point. Good. So my name is Chris Hollinger. I'm going to uh, conclude here with the uh, last half of the presentation, and that fourth dimension that Ben Dorsey was uh, referring to is um, what I'm going to call the smart grid solution. And, and of course, smart grid is um, something that I'm sure all of you have heard about. But uh, my, my uh, purpose for talking about it is I think that that's going to be probably the next real big thing when it comes to our industry and where we're all going. And the reason being is that we talked a lot about integrating buildings, automation, those three axes that, that Ben talked about. And that's all, that's all fabulous stuff. And it's, we have to continue to make more progress there. I've been working on integration for a long time now. And I've seen great progress. But frankly, there's more progress to be made. But the, uh, the next level is the smart grid. Because we've, we've done a good job of dealing with the demand side, now we have to figure out how to make the demand and supply side from a utilities perspective and an electrical um, power perspective work together. And that's the challenge that I think we all face. So this is just, this is just a quick definition from the uh, US Department of Energy. And uh, essentially, I'll, I'll summarize and say that what they're, what they're suggesting, and I believe this is true, is we need to take the automation that we've, we've enjoyed in industrial systems and in building automation systems and HVAC systems, and we need to take it to the, the supply side as well. So the demand side is pretty well covered. We all, I think, are understanding uh, what we need to do from that perspective, but how we take it to the supply side and make sure those two interact well. So that's really the, the bottom line is what the um, US Department of Energy is suggesting, and I, I believe that's true. So if we take a look at the uh, you know, current, or, or this is called yesterday, but frankly, it's, it's current in most cases, you really have very limited communication. It's essentially the utilities are supplying, supplying what we need for power, at least what they believe we need for power. And we use it, but there's no interaction going back and forth, or very little interaction going back and forth. So that's really the challenge. How do we go from one-way power supply type of, type of model that we are dealing with to something far more intelligent, where, where the systems can work together, the consumers and the suppliers can work together to be more efficient overall. Because frankly, the, the uh, suppliers of, of power also have an interest here. They can't build power, power plants very easily. Very expensive, very difficult to do. Neighbors don't want them, essentially, especially um, uh, in my state, Illinois. We've, we've been fighting against our power, power company for a while now. Not, not, uh, me, myself, but, but a lot of the folks that are, that are potentially getting power plants in their vicinity. They don't want them, and I don't blame them. So, so frankly, it's going to be difficult to supply more power. So the question is, how do we reduce the demand? 
So this is what we're dealing with right now. And where do we want to go for tomorrow? I think tomorrow what we'd like to see is bi-directional communication. So what we enjoy with the, the uh, building automation systems, the integrated building automation systems that Ben talked about, let's enjoy that same type of automation with the utilities as well. So bi-directional uh, metering, bi-directional communication, bi-directional power flow. Uh, ben talked about uh, uh, renewable energy sources. Once buildings have renewable energy, they can then supply power, not only for themselves, but also back to the grid. So those are the types of things that I think the power industry is very excited about. Applications, as we get more, more of these sophisticated solutions, then the applications can be there. Automated demand response is a classic example of that type of an application. So again, we have a more interrelated, integrated solution, not just in the building, but in the overall infrastructure of, our, of uh, all of our buildings and the utilities themselves. Also, in the bottom there, I talk about today, essentially, the, the best examples that we have today right now are peak demand management, demand limiting types of solutions, intelligent load management types of solutions. And those are, those are absolutely available today. There's uh, states that are essentially mandating that, California being one of them, for new buildings. So it's certainly something that can be accomplished. The smart grid adds uh, full communications, intelligence, and transparency. Transparency is really the critical piece here because um, why did we create VDC systems in the first place? We created it for largely transparency of what's happening in your building, and the same is true for, for the power utilities side. So we want to get to the point where we can provide that transparency, and with that transparency, you can essentially create what we call a virtual power plant. Every building has power usage, power needs, but they also have power that's available to be put back into the grid, either because they supply power or they can reduce the power that they need. If they reduce the power that they need, then the suppliers don't have to supply as much power, right? So it's all about, redund we talk about redundancy of the systems, it's also about redundancy of the power from the perspective